My name is Uchi Oko, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 34th session of the Next Year Power Dialogue. The Next Year Power Dialogue is a monthly public discourse with three main objectives. We aim to share ideas and information about the power sector. We aim to advocate public policy. And then we also aim to highlight key business and investment opportunities. So tonight, we'll be continuing our discussions from last month, where we discussed coordination and sector governance. Well, basically, we agreed last month that efficient and effective sector coordination is vital to the development and sustainability of the sector. So today, we would aim to highlight at the end of this dialogue the current state of the corporate governance structure in Nigeria, as well as propose and promote vital ideas that would ensure efficient and effective market regulation as well as sector governance. But before we do that, I'd like to point out that we gave out surveys to you. The major aim of this survey is to elicit information from you regarding the most significant issues facing the power sector today. So please take out time to do the survey and would you leave them on your seats before you leave? Today as well, we also introduced a new feature to our dialogue. We are adding a WhatsApp questioning feature where you can ask us your questions via WhatsApp. There's a dedicated line behind your program, so just look at the number there, WhatsApp us your questions, be concise, and please include your name at the, at the end of your question. Driving our discussions today, we have as moderator, Mr. Desmond Ogba. Mr. Desmond is presently a partner, finance, energy, and project practice groups at Templars Law Firm. Prior to that, he worked at J. Elias & Co. in Lagos, as well as was a visiting associate at Latham & Watkins in London. So please, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for being here. And please join me in welcoming the moderator and our panelists today. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this month's dialogue. It's a large audience, and we're pleased to have you, um, the panelists and I. I will go straight into the business of the evening. And that will be by introducing members of the panel. Um, to my right is Mrs. Ife Inwa, um, who is currently principal consultant at MTech Energy Services. And prior to that, she was, the, she was, she, she, she was part of the ECOWAS regulator for electricity. Uh, welcome, Mr. Fenua. And to, to my left is engineer Simeon Otakolo. I, I had to ask him this evening how to pronounce his name correctly. And I, I'm sure I'm sure I got, I got it correctly. He's, he's currently senior, senior advisor at the World Bank for Energy. And welcome this evening. I, I, I'm sure I've not, I've, not done, I've not done justice in introducing both of you, so I'll allow you to talk a, a little about yourself and then give us an overview of what you'd expect from you um, this evening. And I'll start with you, Mr. Sakula. Well, is this supposed to be... So introduce yourself a bit and then... And then go ahead with the... Absolutely. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Like I said, my name is Simeon. I like to use Simeon because sometimes his surname is difficult to so just call me Simeon. I should try it. Okay, it's called Atakulu. Well, a lot of people give it all sorts of interpretation. Okay. <clears throat> but I like to be called Simeon. Yeah, I'm currently a, an advisor with uh, the World Bank on Energy and the Nigerian market and Prior then, I was advisor to BFID and the NIAF program. Prior to that, I was also advisor to the government and the presidential tax force. And beyond then, I was, before then, I was head of operation for the national utility. So this is generally my background. Now, considering the discussion for today, my role is to take you back to understand where we're coming from to where we are today and where we're going, why we're talking about. Because when you talk about governance, we all know what governance is about. Take a cue to, your, to the companies. It's a requirement that every company should have a governing structure. Remember that because that will be playing out in most of the discussion. Transparency and accountability. These are the key things that drive whether it's company governance, whether it's your home, whatever. So when you look back where we're coming from, 
pre-2013, we had one structure, which is like the, the power industry represented by NEPA or PHCN as it's known. Then we have the big, bo the big board at the back, which is the Ministry of Power. Then there is the silent group that nobody seems to hear, but they're very important and they plays a role in the whole setting, which is the Energy Commission of Nigeria, which is a statutory body that was set up to more, not regulate, but at least to set the policy guidelines on energy and, of course, power. It's a component of that. So this was a structure. So it was easy at that time to govern because you had the Ministry of Power setting the policy, you have ECN that puts the overall framework, and then you have NEPA or PHN as is known, that does the implementation and the planning. So it was, but post 2013, when we moved to privatization, not just privatization, into a regulated market. Before now, it was pre-regulated. Transiting 2013, we entered a regulated market. And what did that mean? We had now close to 10 or 12 different players. PHCM was broken down into how many companies? Close to 18. Minister of Power was still there. ECN is there. Now the National Assembly is beginning to play a strong role. Now you had other licensees like NBET. You had TCN that are not actually licensees in the market, but they are strong stakeholders. Then you have BP, who is the octopus in the privatization. Now, assuming these 25 set of people are doing things the way they like, where are we going to end up? Confusion. And this is where the whole problem of the sector is heading to. So I need to differentiate two different key components here. Because many times people are talking about the sector, but actually they are talking about the market. The sector is a bigger component beyond the market. So we need to differentiate when we are talking about sector governance. Because the market governance has a different, slightly approach to the overall sector governance. And that brings in the player. This why I've done this is so that you understand the various players in the sector. ECN is there. They created the national energy policy, which is a clear directive of the federal government on how power energy should go. What are the resources that are available? How are you going to use the resources? Because that goes to influence your national plan on power. Now, there's a Ministry of Power that is there to actually crystallize these policies into power because they have this statutory responsibility for generation, transmission, distribution, naming. As long as within the National Council on Power, that is the structure. They have that responsibility. Now, because we've gone post-2013, we have decided to create a commercial market. And for you to run the commercial market, we've now brought in the regulator who has the technical and commercial responsibility to regulate the market and is governed by the Act. Now, you can then see that if we don't have a clear stakeholder management of all these people, the market will not grow. And that's where we are today. I brought this introduction so that you understand that without a clear definition and clarity on how these roles interplay, then we have a problem. Take, for example, for you to regulate the market, we have three or four clear documents that guide the market. The grid code, the market rules, out of which the, the, the regulator has created the distribution code, created the metering code, and series of regulations and orders. All these are meant to guide the way the market is governed. Assuming that any of these players, be they distribution companies, be they generating companies, 
be the TCN itself, who is the market operator and the system operator, be it embed, decides to shift from the component of this market. Becomes a problem for the market, I say. Thank you. I'll, I'll pause you there for a second okay. and, and, come, and come back to um, Mr. Feinwa. Okay. Uh, do, do you want to just do a brief introduction of yourself and um, talk about what we expect to hear from you um, this, this evening? Okay, thank you very five much. Minutes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ife Ikono, like um, a dustman had earlier introduced, basically. Uh, in terms of um, my background, I currently work as an electricity sector policy and regulations consultant. Um, I'm working with uh, the EU, USID on a number of projects within the ECOWAS region and also in Zambia. Prior to then, you know, up until 2016, I was on the council of the ECOWAS Regional Electricity Regulatory Authority Herrera in Ghana where I left as the chairperson. And uh, before uh, working with Herrera, I was also part of the setup staff in NEC. So uh, some of us were seconded to start up NEC when it was created in 2005. And I was there for five years until I left. And of course, I had also had the opportunity of working with the utility PLC and then really. So uh, in essence, uh, I've had the privilege of pretty much working across the entire gamut of the power sector, from the utility side to the regulatory side to policy to markets and all of that. So um, I'm quite glad to be part of this discussion uh, this evening. Uh, I, th you know, I think personally that governance is uh, at the core of power sector development, not just in this country, but pretty much in most of sub-Saharan Africa. And until we are able to get the governance right, until we're able to take up all the challenges and address them effectively, my thoughts are that we would keep stumbling along for quite a while to come. You know, he gave like a very brief introduction of um, how uh, it was important that we you know, um, that we put in place an effective governance structure to regulate the market. But beyond that, I think uh, I also want to, uh, to now emphasize the fact that uh, NEC is not just a market regulator, but its mandate is actually to regulate the power sector, which, like he had said, goes beyond the market. And in looking at the sector, he has also pointed out the fact that there are a whole number of key stakeholders and the number of stakeholders have increased over time when we moved from when we had a vertical integrated NEPA to the PHCN to the 18 successor companies to the privatized entities and to all of the bits that are sprouting out from even the current structure. So that brings to bear the fact that if we are not able to find a cohesive way of putting all of these stakeholders together, of coordinating them effectively, of having somebody who has a mandate to drive this process, or perhaps a group of people who have the mandate to drive this process, then it will be difficult to move forward as a sector, basically. So uh, real briefly, because I think that I have just five minutes for my opening remarks, uh, I just want to clearly state why is sector governance critical in terms of market development, basically. One thing is this, we now have a regulatory sector, like I said, where you have a lot of private sector entities. And part of the reason why we created a regulator in 2005 was to tell the world that we are ready to open up our market to be able to attract private sector investments into a sector then that was crying out for more funds, injection, and of course there were all kinds of challenges with the ability of the government to fund the sector. So the whole idea was put in place a structure that tells people that there is some independent body besides the ministry who can effectively oversee the entire sector. Put in place regulations that are clear transparent, 
credible because those are the kind of things that are necessary for the sustainability of any market. People want credibility, people want transparency, people want accountability. People need to know who do you hold responsible when things go wrong. People need to understand that if there are issues, how are you going to resolve disputes and all of that. And when you look at all of these key requirements, and you look at the mandate of NEC as created under the EPSR Act, is it has essentially been created to bridge this gap, to let market players, let investors, let other stakeholders know that moving forward, there are clear rules in place, and this is going to be the rule of the game moving you know, um, from now forward. But I also want to point out that when you look at governance, like uh, Simeon has said, it's not just looking at the regulator alone. There are different levels of it. You have the policy makers, which I talked about, the ministry playing a role, and the, uh, and the, and the energy commission. Personally, I believe that the customers have a key role as key stakeholders, really, because they should be asking questions. They should be holding these agencies accountable. We have the National Assembly. We have the companies themselves. So it's just a whole gamut of critical stakeholders, which is where you cannot discuss governance without talking about coordination. That is where, that uh, moving forward, you will see us talking more about the interplay between sector governance and coordination because you can't do one without the other. So I'm going to pause um, here basically because these are just introductory remarks and hope to talk more specifically in terms of what I think NEC has done and in terms of what I think other agencies have done and what should be done in order to improve some of the challenges that we face presently, because like we all know, there are loads and loads of challenges. But I'm sure that we'll discuss more on that when we go to the specifics. Thank you. Thank you. So we've done this brief remarks to establish the credentials of the members of the panel who will be speaking to us um, going forward this evening. So we we'll have two experienced people and very articulate um, panelists to talk us through the session this evening. And in, as for those of you who attend next year often, uh, the way we run this is we then go into the moderated session uh, where the panelists will talk us through the evening. But a very important segment of that is, is the lovely audience where we receive questions from you, uh, whether, whether for those who raise their hands to ask questions or send messages on WhatsApp. Uh, one thing someone mentioned while walking into this room is that there's a lot of jaw jaw in the, pub, in, in, in the power sector. People talk a lot about it. and things never get implemented. But I do know that it is the more we talk about these things, the more awareness you create, and the more people are able to form more advocacy groups to push policies. And as is, is typical with next year, I expect that at the end of this, there will be a community out there where they push out to policy makers and decision makers and see how we can lobby to get these things um, to, to steer the ship of, of, of the sector to, uh, on the right path. That's the whole essence of, of this conversation. So I will now move into, into um, the moderator session. And I'll start with you. Um, in your opening remarks, you, you talked about the need for transparency and contractual discipline. And a number of people have said that, and you also said, if you must have a sector where people adhere to governance issues, you will need people who stick to the rules of the game. And people have said that one way of ensuring that people stick to the rules is to impose sanctions on erring participants. And so could you give us your perspective on how to enforce transparency and contractual discipline and adherence to rules in the sector and ensure that we get ourselves on the right path? Yeah, I think I will take it back from the point I made. The whole essence of a regulated market is that it's rule-based. Mm. <clears throat> and so when, before you talk of uh, enforcement or transparencies, there has to be the plan. And that plan is what are the structures that you've put in place and what are the, the systems that are going to drive those structures. So for you to run, the, like I said, there is the grid code. There is the market rules. And these are the two key documents outside the regulations and the orders that the, the NEC has put forward. These are the two key documents from which you have the operating procedures and the market procedure that guides the relationships. 
Remember, the contracts are actually not the regulator's contracts. So I have to be very specific on that. Because the contracts are within the wholesale trader and the participants. NEC is like the licensure. Let's license these people to operate in the market. But in doing that, there are conditions for the license. And it is within this condition of the license that NEC has the, the, the space to control their behaviors because they sign into a level of performance. So when you sign into a level of performance, NEC holds you responsible for that level of performance. But the challenge is if if I'm not able to monitor you, to evaluate you, to benchmark you, and to have accurate data on the which I can measure your performance, and I, I'm not able also to put together a structure that enables me to sanction you, then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the flip side, when we talk of contracts, a license is a kind of contract, really. But the real market contracts are the vesting contracts, the PPAs. This is where the real issue is. Next signs them off, but actually the operator of these contracts is the ANBET, who is the wholesale trader. But do not forget also that at the back of it, this is where the complications of the governing comes in. On the back of it, there is the performance agreement. They were signed with BPE. And those performance agreements are mirroring also next understanding of the performance of these companies. So when you put all this together, what is important is how well the regulator is able to put together his monitoring program. And for you to have an effective monitoring program, remember, you must have a clear performance benchmark setting data acquisition and data quality control, then you can begin to measure gaps. You can begin to implement sanctions. If you cannot manage the entire performance management program, I'm afraid it'd be extremely difficult to apply sanctions. And this is where the controversy has been coming between NEC and the licensees. I think I'll stop at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, Turning to you, um, the, the coordination and governance of the power sector is to a large extent, but not completely a regulatory issue. And you, you have the distinction of having worked for the regulator in Nigeria and also um, having, having led the regulator in West Africa. And with, with that interplay of your experience, what do you think we can learn in the Nigerian market uh, from, 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 from the West of from regional markets that you led, you led at some point, specifically in respect of sector governance and, and coordination. Brief clarification on what Simon just talked about in terms of uh, the monitoring and enforcement and all of that. I, I, you know, I just want to point out that NEC actually does have a regulation on reporting obligations. And um, the... A regulation on what? Reporting obligations of, of licenses, okay. really, which if properly implemented, should allow NEC to publish and indeed benchmark the performance of all of these licenses on a number of parameters, which when you look at it, pretty much covers the entire gamut of what would make for an effective market. Indeed, I remember, uh, you know, Back then, soon after that regulation was done in about 2008, you could find some of those reports on the NEC website, but nothing of that nature is done today. So the question and the challenge is, why is NEC not doing what it ought to do, even though that it has regulations that clearly say, or, or uh, uh, that clearly empowers it to do that? And again, there are all kinds of uh, softwares and all of that that you can use to make this done in a very simple way. I mean, he had talked about the issue of benchmarking. For us, again, yeah. you know, I may be dovetailing into your question in terms of what has worked in the ECOWAS region and, of course, perhaps sharing some of the experiences where I think that uh, we might learn you know, uh, in terms of uh, improving 
our structure here, basically. Yes, Nigeria is a very complicated market in terms of the numbers and all that. There's no doubt about that. But if you also look at ECOWAS as a region, you're talking about 15 different countries at different levels of development, of which Nigeria is one anyway, because and Nigeria is a part of ECOWAS. So even all the complications of, of Nigeria still dovetails into the regional markets. And in doing that, what we realized is that without proper coordination, it would be impossible for you to have a regional regulator that can effectively regulate the markets. Let me say that uh, part of the vision in creating Herrera was to see how we could find a way of, you know, of bringing together all the resources we have within the ECOWAS region, taking into cognizance the fact that some countries are far better endowed than others. Some have, I mean, countries like Nigeria, we have resources, uh, gas, hydro, and all of them. Then you, you, you juxtapose it like maybe other countries like Niger. Yes, they have uranium, but of course, nobody's talking about nu nuclear power for now and all of that. And Nigeria still remains the primary supplier of electricity for that region. Now, again, um, what we tried to do, and which I think it's also critical in moving forward the governance structure today in Nigeria is to ensure that you have a mechanism that allows for regular stakeholder consultations at the governance end, basically. So, for instance, at the area thing, we have what we call the Constitutive uh, Committee of regulators, cohesive committees of operators, then of the ministries as well. Because power sector governance is not just about regulation, it's about ensuring that all of the little bits and pieces work together. The operators have a very key role to play, the ministries have key roles to play, the, the customers or consumers have very important roles to play, so do the regulators. And of course, it's easier from the regulatory point of view where you have put in place a structure that allows everybody to have some sense of ownership of whatever regulations or whatever guidelines that you have in place, and people understand clearly what the impact of whatever any rules that you need to put in place is going to have on the larger industry. When you have that sense of ownership, it's much easier to get compliance. It's also much easier for people to have the level of confidence in a regulator that will help in driving the market. From my own, uh, uh, from, uh, from my experience, I've seen that in countries where the regulators are, well, uh, should I use the word, better respected, there seems to be a lot more in terms of sources and all of that. Let me use Ghana, for instance, because that is the, the one country I can compare with Nigeria in terms of uh, market development, because those perhaps are the only two countries that have an electricity market today in West Africa. The others are still working towards that and all of that. There has been a degree of consistency in terms of what they have done as a country to ensure that even when you have a change of ministers or change of whatever, the, you have a steering committee of sorts that remains constantly in place of technical experts in the sector, regardless of whether they are regulators or they are operators and all of that, who help in driving their integrated power system master plan and all of that. I'm not sure if today in Nigeria we have a you know, an integrated power system master plan. I think that is critical. That should, that's a document that we ought to have developed from our energy policy. And that document would show every stakeholder in the sector, particularly the ministry, the regulator, the licenses, what's, what their role ought to be in terms of meeting the policy directives 
that has been put in place by the ministry, supported by the Energy Commission. So again, you are talking about how do you coordinate. I think that a key requirement is having a structure in place at top, you know, on top that has all of the key stakeholders. But I mean, but that body in itself is not going to usurp the distinct roles of each of the bodies. And we know clearly what the role of NEC is. The EPSR Act is very, very clear on that. And if NEC plays its role properly, then I'm sure that perhaps there will not be any need for all of this, uh, um, you know, and all of these bodies that keep coming up and all of that. If the ministry is also very clear of its role and it focuses on that as well, then we shouldn't have a problem and all of So I think that in terms of coordination, we need to look at having a body at that level that continues because I remember that this is a marketing transition. We haven't gotten there yet. It's going to take a while. So I think that, uh, you know, we thought, oh, that we have privatized and everybody went to bed and says, okay, let everything just continue to wait. But it's not so. I remember, you know, in, like, we kind of thought, oh, that with privatization, it be like a lot more easier to regulate the market, that you're dealing with private sector entities and all of that. But unfortunately, <laughs> Is it been, sorry, are, are, yeah. you, are you suggesting that in addition to the several bodies we have now, we create another body to coordinate the activities of every person in the market? For me, it's not necessarily a body as in uh, an organization or what, because my problem is all of these, um, you know, these entities, there is NEMSA, there is the NEG, there is, I mean, we just create bodies. Very soon, I'm sure they'll have a renewable energy agency and energy efficiency agency and all of that. For me, those are not important. But I'm saying that you already have today all of these entities and all of that. But we must have an integrated power sector master plan. Who is in charge of that? It's not just going to be the ministry. The ministry obviously will drive it because it's going to be a, you know, a policy. But I think that that will help. But when it comes to the sector governance itself, because you, you are, you know, uh, your question was on coordination. I think that coordination requires that you have at least some committee. Well, again, um, I'm also not giving to committees that stay on and on forever, basically. But if it's a technical committee that is there, you know, I don't have to keep resolving it and all of that. There's an IPSMP, there are targets there, there are guidelines, there are things that should be done at this stage. Because what we have today, I think, is a marketing chaos, if you ask me, basically. Everybody seems to think that the other person is not doing their job and some other person, you know, and others are usurping others without look, focusing on their own. You talked about the performance contract. For me, it's not even a question of whether it's next thing. When those, uh, when the discos, you know, got their licenses, those performance contracts were listed as a part of what they need to comply with. So at that stage, PPE hands off and NEC takes over the process. So it's not a question of saying, okay, because I signed the performance contract, then you're not a regulator, or NEC now says this is BPE's rule and all of that. I think the rules are clear, but what is important is how do we go about implementing it? There's just way too much confusion in the sector today. So perhaps if all of them got together and they spoke, then they will be able to now resolve it in that one little place. Not you know, uh, everyone sitting down in their silos and deciding, well, uh, this is what I should do. Uh, the minister perhaps says, okay, our neck is not doing enough, then let me take over the role of the regulator. So we, we need a general superintendent kind of role. There has to role. be a general, uh, and like I said, in doing that, it should be a coordinated, you know, it's not one party. You have representatives from each of those, so it's not just saying, okay, this is that team. For you to be on that team means that you are representing NERC, you are representing the ministry, you are representing the energy commission, you are representing uh, maybe four, five, six key stakeholders. That's one unwieldy body that we never ever get any results because the bigger the committees, the less effective they are from my own experience anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I take on from there because that's a very key... Absolutely. Yeah. Why I want to play that is so that you understand the kind of confusion that we're already going through. I remember when we were making the discussion yesterday, today, I took them a, a step backward to when we had the presidential tax force on power. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, this is akin to what, we say, what you're saying. It's like a tax force. It's like 
it's a kind of steering committee, a kind of, uh, you see, but the danger, the problem that you, you face is when you put up those kind of uh, body, which is right at this stage of the confusion in the market, where will it derive its authority? This is the challenge that has been faced in the last 12 months. It's not difficult to pick people and put in committees, and they finish and they dump their paper and go away. The presidential tax force succeeded in driving through the privatization, which no other situation could do because it had a strict presidential authority. Now, so if you're going to be looking at the steering committee, or call it whatever, a supervisory, I wouldn't like the word supervisory because it creates some kind of, uh, a kind of stakeholder agree, uh, consultation or interministerial, I think we like that a lot, interministerial body. body. But what is key is where is it deriving its authority? Because if the authority is not coming from the real command and control, you cannot control NEC. So this is the challenge in designing that the will of the political, at the presidency or the vice president, are they willing to do that? Because it, it requires a lot of political will, like the case of the presidential tax force. So I will leave it at that. Why I brought that up is that I've gone through that in the last 12 months, designing that under the PSRP to see how it's going to function. And these are the challenges that you face. That is the solution to our problem in the interim period of the reset and controlling the direction the market should go. But the challenge is how do you set it up and give it the authority that it requires to be able to do that? Two different committees have been set up. My friend there has been looking at me and they fizzled out even from the day you set it up because he had no authority. So if you're going to go that route, which for me, is a, is a requirement at the stage we are now, because we're in utter confusion. But you need to pinpoint where the authority is coming from, and who is that authority you're going to put there that represents that authority. If you do that successfully, then we can turn this market around in the next two years and let it move on its own. So, so political will is absolutely important. But I, I, important. I won't allow you to leave it there, uh, because yeah. you, over the last several months, we've had the Minister of Power hold monthly sessions with various stakeholders in the sector. One would have thought that, uh, listening to you, the, the, what, what I take away is that, that that monthly session, all those monthly sessions, appear to be another talk show. Uh, is, are, are you suggesting that the ideas that come out of, that, out of those sessions have not been sufficient to, to get us to where we need to be? I won't call them a talk show. We need the, remember when I started, we need to differentiate. For every meeting, for every committee you set up, they have a different objective. For me, the objective of that meeting was more operational than strategic. Mm -hmm. You understand? And that's why most of the discussions in those monthly meetings were purely what next should be driving. They are operational issues. We are talking now about strategic issues, issues that require behavior, transparency, accountability. Who is, NEC, who is holding NEC responsible for failure to drive the market? Who is holding NBET responsible? Who is holding TCA? See, who is holding the Ministry of Power? Because they have a role. One movement from the Ministry of Power can destroy everything that you're doing. One movement from the National Assembly can destroy everything. So who is looking? This is where this body is different because it's taking authority. Those are operational meetings that the minister can do with his team. Okay? We want to generate 20 megawatts. We want to generate 30. Oh, this person is not having supply. This person. These are operational issues. We're talking about key strategic sector-driven issues. I take an example, what she said about the integrated plan. There is a clear misunderstanding so far what an integrated plan is. So, People look at the operational plans and confuse it with the national integrated plan. 
let me put forward that today, the way the market is structured, the way the sector is structured, it is the role of the, of, of the National Electric Regulatory Commission as of today. Because if you go to the grid code and the market rules, the specification and clear how integrated plans should be made is clearly stated in the sectors, sections in the market rule and in the grid code. What is missing is the strategy. Because every, sec every sector is doing its own. ECN is doing its own. Ministry is doing its own. TCN is doing its own. It is the regulator that should set out. I'll give you an example. Cameroon today, they put out a commission for five different studies. Because the integrated plan is made up of five different studies. The first study is the national demand study, which is the starting point. You've got to understand your demand. Then you do the generation survey. That's a separate study, because there are different consultants that do that. Then you then do the transmission survey that integrates that. But what we have always missed out is forgetting the distribution survey. And that's why we have all this confusion today about load rejection and things like that. Now, beyond that, there's the fifth component, which is where the issue about NEC and who drives it comes from, and that's the economic studies. Because when you finish this plant and it does not fit into the regulated asset base, then you have a problem. So NEC would then commission an economic studies. If you look at the Cameroonian uh, bid, the fifth component of that is is what then finally derives what you call the LCDP, the Least Cost Development Power Plan. When you have that, then you have your integrated plan that you're talking about. And that guides everybody, whether you're a minister of environment, whether you're a minister, because you cannot build a new power plant. You cannot build a new transmission line that is outside the integrated plan. NEC will not sign you in, except you're doing it as a grant. Okay? Thank you. You want to say something? For you know, I agree in total with him, basically. But, but uh, beyond that, you know, um, you know, because uh, we've said clearly that the starting point is to have that, because every stakeholder in the sector needs to know where we're going and all of that. But more importantly, I, I see the need for NEC as sector regulator to be a lot more proactive in terms of pushing the market forward. Because if all of this is done and we have all of this beautiful plan and all of that, and you still have a regulator that is resting on its oars, I'm not too sure that we're going to make a lot of progress. And coming into that, um, I am one of those who shared the opinion that Perhaps it's time that uh, the ministry, the presidency, and all of that might begin to look even at the structure of NEC as it's currently constituted. Personally, I'm of the opinion that part of the inhibiting factor in NEC's efficiency today is the way the commission is constituted. Uh, this is a country where we've done regulation since 2005, this is 2019, and all of that. The Act is clear on who should come in as commissioners and all of that. The Act is also talks about all of the geopolitical things and all of that. But, but uh, I, I think that Nigeria is blessed with human resources pretty much all over and all of that. I, I think that uh, Government must be bold to look again at how NEC commissioners are appointed. I'm not saying this that, I mean, these are experts in their areas, you know, very competent and all that. But I'm also aware that there have been challenges where you're coming out for the first two years, you're trying to understand the market, and before you know it, your five year tenure is over and all that. That is one. Two is, I wonder often if we we'll require seven full-time commissioners, commissioners for NEC. Typically, most commissions would have three full-time commissioners. Then perhaps if you want a commissioner as big as seven, you might have to put the other four 
on part-time basis. So what happens is that they act as a commission. A commission should be looked more as like a board of directors, as it were, basically. But where you have commissioners playing the role of maybe heads of departments and all of that, it, it, you know, it waters down the effectiveness of what ought to be done in terms of being uh, transparent, in terms of actually uh, looking at the industry from the perspective of a holistic view, instead of looking at it perhaps from the rather a narrow vision of your department. If you're commissioner on legal licensing, perhaps you might be saying, okay, I'm well interested in legal and licensing instead of looking at the sector as a whole, basically. So I think that these are some of the issues that we need to look at. And again, let me also say this, because for me, I, as a woman, I mean, I sit down and I have seven men as net commissioners. For crying out loud, we are in 2019. Issues of gender mainstreaming are critical. Absolutely. They are important. Studies and studies have been done in the need to balance roles and the fact to have broader representations and all that. ECOWAS has recently passed a policy on gender mainstreaming and hopefully we want to push forward and have a directive that would actually compel member states to begin to look at the broader issue of addressing gender, not just in appointments but even in projects. You, you know that today when we do the ESIs, a requirement that is just the environmental and the social impact. But gender assessment is also critical in terms of driving projects. So these are things I think that we need to look at in terms of NEC as it is today. The effectiveness of NEC, because when it comes to regulations, believe you me, there are loads and loads of regulations, the grid code, the market rules, the licensing guidelines, the reporting obligations, consumer complaints. I mean, NEC has done tremendously well in terms of all of that. But what is key is enforcement. What I also think that we need to begin to look at from the point of view of the regulator is, us, you know, uh, is also the need to do the periodic, what we call, regulatory impact assessment studies. If you've done regulations that are not being complied with, you need to look around and say, why is it not working, basically? You do what, you, what is called a regulatory impact assessment. I know this is not being done today. Even for the new regulations that are coming, I mean, yeah, we had a process that was on 2005. Since then, so many things have evolved, but we're still doing the same thing today. We must look, begin to look at broader perspectives in terms of consultation. If we're going to look at new regulations, we must do much better you know, as a regulator, you must, like you talked about, there are all kinds of economic underpinnings of most of the major issues. Yes, there's eligibility that was just declared and all of that, but the Act itself also says that if declaration of eligibility is going to cause some cause, then there must be a compensation fund that is put in place. I'm not sure. I mean, at no time when I looked at the compensation paper, did I see anything to do with terms of what are the economic impacts of declaring eligibility, which itself is not a bad thing, basically. But for people to have a holistic understanding, you must look at it from the point of view that we are now in an electricity market and the economics matter even far more than the technical issues. We have excellent engineers in this country today. Why are we having more problems? Because we're talking about markets, which is more about commercial issues, which is, which, uh, and the, which is more about contractual issues, uh, economics, and all of that. And that is where the gap is today. So perhaps it's also important that the regulator finds ways of building capacity around these areas that will make it far more effective. You must be one step ahead of your licensee. If you're not, you're not going to get the right data. And if you don't know it's, that it's not the right data, you end up working with the wrong data. Then tomorrow you're going to sit down and look for who to blame. So capacity is so key to effective regulation. So these are just you know, a few thoughts that I have in terms of how can we improve the performance of NEC. NEC, I believe, is key. For countries that have made strides, like I said before, is where you've had a very robust commission that has been able to drive the market. If it's not there, then perhaps this confusion would have to continue for a while. So even beyond that coordination, we must find ways of strengthening the effectiveness of NEC. 
to ensure that they deliver clearly on their mandate. So, so I'm looking at my phone and someone has picked up the point you made and mm -hmm. saying one, of the, one, one something else we can do is to ensure that commissioners are appointed based on their experience and not based, and not on, on, not based on bias or geopolitical True. reasons. And that is something to ensure that we bring in, if you are trying to nurse a sector, you need to bring people who can drive that sector and not necessarily bring in the geopolitical distribution into uh, it in the first absolutely. instance. Yeah, one yeah. of the key things that find, which we don't do, is not just appointing the people, you should put it on a competitive recruitment basis. Exactly. This is I how agree. it's done. Absolutely. If you want commissioner for, for, for example, technical, mm. put it out there. The website, people can apply for that, get interviewed, and then you get the right person. It's not by appointments. Those days of appointments are political. Yes. So no matter how you change it, the recruitment process is a key to how you get the right people. Okay. Uh, and, and someone is also asking on WhatsApp, um, are you saying NEC is a problem, the weakest link in the sector? Uh, what is responsible for this? Can this be corrected under the current structure? Otherwise, how can regulation be improved and accountability enhanced across the value chain? That question is from Dio. Um, do you want to take that? I don't want to say neck is the only problem. Because when you say neck is a problem, that, that, that is the weakest. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think, and I believe so, that in a regulated market as we have today, the role of the regulator is key. There's no doubt about that. A strong regulator, a credible regulator, would no doubt help to move the market forward. But beyond that, We've talked about the issue of some of the other key stakeholders, the ministry, the energy commission, and all of that. Political will is very important. You understand? So there are situations where the regulator may do all, of, all it has to do, but where the politicians or the powers that be decide that they will have their say, then that in itself might be a problem itself. So political will is critical. And it's political will that will ensure that a number of these changes that we're talking about are also implemented. If we're saying, okay, review the way NEC commissioners are recruited, it's not NEC that is going to do that. Mm. People are making those appointments. And I dare say that at the time of those, part, those appointments are made, it's not as if uh, they probably didn't have a list of further. So again, you know, um, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that we need to look just beyond the regulator who I have, I mean, who I know is key to this process, but political will is important, and that is why I think that the National Assembly that itself has an oversight over the activities of NEC should also come into play. Every quarter, NEC has an obligation to send a report to the National Assembly, to the Ministry, in terms of what is being done and where the gaps are. There, there has been a lot of talk on this, uh, on this side of the room, and I want to move into the audience participation phase now. Uh, but before that, uh, I have another question here, uh, which is also from the audience. The person said, I think there is a fixation on strategic policy level discourse. Uh, this is important, but perhaps even more important to average consumer, to add the average consumer availability and afford affordability. Are we doing enough to address these? How can we progressively win the confidence of the consumer? Can the market survive without such consumer confidence? You want me to take that again? Yeah, no, I understand what he's saying. Uh, you see, uh, the whole idea of discussing governance is because for you to talk about governance is because you have a goal. That's how a business runs. What is the goal? The, help, the goal is to ensure, that's what NEC is set up for, to ensure that the customer has the best of quality of service at an affordable level. Period. Every other thing that you do, whether it's from distribution, from generation, from transmission, is to feed into this single goal. Now, take it from this point. If you don't have enough power going through the system, or you don't have the necessary commercial arrangements or trading arrangements or the risk mitigation arrangements, you're not going to get to this goal that you're talking about. Therefore, the role of the regulator is to balance all these interests 
whether they're distribution, whether they're generation, whether they're transmission, whether they're the market operator, whatever, is to balance this interest in order to achieve that. And that comes through governance. That comes through benchmarking their performance. Because when you sign your license, for example, you sign to a loss reduction profile, you sign to a load growth pattern. These are two key derivables. You sign to a revenue pattern. Whatever you do, see, let's be honest with what we are discussing. You can't change the profile of the sector because we have, let me take a step back. We have refused to clearly define the kind of market we want to run. And this is the challenge that we are facing, yet we are not seeing it. It's like a business setting up. It's, it's considering whether we are a profit making or an NGO. Of course, you know there's going to be confusion in the strategy. We've transited from a government-controlled power sector to a commercially private-driven, yet we are not allowing the structures, the processes that should lead us into that. And yet we want the results. It's not going to work. So you have to make up your mind. And this is where the political will comes in. We are blaming NEC because NEC is the center of the attraction. But NEC itself is facing a big challenge. Unfortunately, they have not demonstrated that they have the skill and the stakeholder management skill to resolve that. Because a government can be bad, can have their way, because the government is interested in the social. They want to see the people behind them. But you as a regulator will also want to find a way to balance that with the consumer requirement. So whichever way you go, you cannot divorce that neck is in the center, unfortunately. And they have a responsibility to ensure that that market, that that customer-driven incentive, why would a distribution company not want to supply power to a customer if he's making money? Hmm? So you need to balance that incentive to the risk that he has to follow. Now, if the if the distribution company realizes that if I supply power here, I'm losing so much money, he's not going to supply you. So you need the regulator. Why? What you say, you need to be forward looking. You need to have your focus of load growth, of load pattern, and then begin to create, for example, why must we continue today in this big structure of the distribution companies? This is the kind of thinking. Why are we not able to begin to transit into smaller business models that will help to grow the system faster? You see, so these are things that must come from strategic planning and from incentive management. I'll stop for, at this point. I've listened attentively. Uh, my question is directed to Madam Ife Inwa. Uh, talking about market coordination, I also understand that uh, some of our ECOWAS neighbors are still paying diplomatic rates on uh, the power being supplied to them. We also have a compounded problem here because of the markets uh, and the balance sheets of you know, the operators, uh, I would say, in the negative, whether it's the discos, whether it's the Jenkos, or even the CCN. I understand, you know, as a, a media person, there are lots of concerns. And these rates being paid in diplomatic rates are still compounding the problem. I wouldn't know whether you would like to speak to that, whether there are uh, some works being done to ensure that the right rates are paid so that at least it doesn't compound the problem we have here already, you know, with the market coordination. Then I would, I would also want to direct my question with the concerns raised by uh, my, my, the other speaker who talked about maybe possible franchising of some areas. And maybe if we have to reset the market, would you advise for any model? Because as we see it now, the market is weak and underperforming. I wouldn't know whether you have any suggestion to make on possible reset of the market and the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, coordination. I understand there might be need or uh, saying that uh, you need a kind of special body to try to coordinate the, the market. But it's a bit confusing because the thinking is that we have existing laws that sets up agencies and different bodies. 
that clearly specifies what are the roles of these agencies. So if we have these laws, one would expect that there should be standard of performance for each of these agencies. I basically, I, I see it as more like a leadership failure from the different agencies. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to bring in another body that becomes a law to itself and creates more problem for us. I think if there is pure leadership focus, if anybody is not performing, sat the person, send the person out to out of the sector and bring in people that really knows what they need to do. We are the regulator. NEC, I think, NEC should play more of a leadership role within the sector to try to correct those norms. The law is in place. The law is a good law. But it's the practice and application of the law that we have found ourselves in a situation where you have a weak governance structure. Uh, first, uh, the certainty in terms of appointment of commissioners, how they are supposed to be appointed in terms of their expertise. Now, but who, and the law also specifies that at all material times, the commission should be governed by, the commissioners should be in place. So where you don't have commissioners in place, then you, you weaken that institution, and then the regulated entities also take advantage of the fact that you don't have commissioners in place. So responsibility on the part of government requires that at all material times, you must have competent and you must have commissioners in place. Also in the selection process, make sure that you select good commissioners. It does not necessarily require that you have to advertise for people to come and write an exam. That's not even the one, that's not the way it's done globally. But the most important thing is get the right persons in place. Now at the same time, the Ministry of Power has to clearly understand what their role is in terms of policy direction. The act specifies functions for the minister. But when you give an impression of when you have a situation where it does appear as if there's parallel regulations going on, both in the ministry and in NEC, you weaken NEC as an institution. So it's important that even the meetings that you have on a regular basis, stakeholder meetings, those meetings should be coordinated by NEC and not necessarily by the ministry. Otherwise, you cause a lot of distortion in the industry. Now, uh, the other aspect, again, as to creating additional institutions, to me, I feel that it's absolutely not necessary because when you do that, you have to create a law, and if you don't create a law, if, you don't put, if they don't come by way of a law, they cannot also function effectively. So essentially, I feel that the sector is, has properly, I mean, proper governance laws in place. It just requires that it should be done properly by whoever has the responsibility. We should also be very careful so that we don't have a situation that for we as a nation, when we don't succeed politically, we say, oh, it's a parliamentary system that has failed. And then we move to the presidential system. Once we start practicing the presidential system, the next thing is that where we have challenges, the next thing we start saying is that let us change our constitution. So let us not just rush to say we want to go ahead and change the governance structure and perhaps come up with a model that may end up not working. Thank you address uh, my question to Simeon. You, you mentioned the rather confused state of the market at the moment, not just the market, but the sector as a whole. And uh, it's a panoply of so many things. Um, but we're also looking at good practice, looking at what happens in other jurisdictions. In the UK, for example, you have, it was like that, following privatization. There was a lot of confusion as well about that. But what they've done is they've had a mature approach. And they're not shy to bring in foreigners from anywhere, bring in experts. Uh, that's part of our hindrance here. We're handicapped. It's got to be somebody from next door. It's got to be from my family. It's got to be from my village. Okay? But they brought in people from other parts of Europe, from China, to come and reorganize the UK market. It just seems to be something we don't know how to do. We, we just have a problem with saying, like Dubai says, like UAE says, excellence wherever it may be found, which is what I think we need right now, even if it's you know, for a, a, a given space of time. The confusion that you were describing and you were looking for perhaps a solution, you talked about it, um, sort of presidential task force. Um, I would recommend that if that is a stopgap measure to fix things now before we get to where you're suggesting, Perhaps the model of uh, PEBEC, you know, the Presidential Enabling uh, uh, you know, Business Act, that has worked. 
because we also had the same sort of thing in that sector with the different ministries competing against one another and the agencies failing to do their job. As soon as Pebec came and the three executive orders arrived, everybody sat up and is working right now. So that could be perhaps something to look at in terms of the interim measure before, but it doesn't replace a strategic solution, which is of a permanent nature. Thank you. My name is uh, Mr. Uket Obonga, Secretary Nekan. The two panelists uh, talked on the role, the critical role, electricity consumers have to play if the sector must succeed. My question is, what is the role? Have we defined the role? Have we identified the role? So I wanted to either of them to talk on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the question from, from, from for, for you. One is the CEB where you supply Benay and Togo. And uh, in both of these situations, like you rightly pointed out, the costs, you know, is not cost reflected. Again, let's, let us also recall that at the time uh, these contracts were negotiated. We were not even dealing with a cost-reflective market anyway. This was a time that even tariffs that we were paying back home were not cost-reflective. You know, the government decided to impose whatever tariff. There were no road studies. There was nothing at that point. So that is part of the genesis of it. And again, uh, it also happened at a time, of course, that Nigeria uh, you know, was playing the big brother role. But moving forward in terms of what has been done, let me say that uh, at the ECOWAS stage, what we did in Herrera was to review all of these existing cross-border transactions, not just between Nigeria and uh, its neighboring countries, but also amongst other West African countries, because there is an interconnection agreement between Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Burkina Faso, uh, Senegal, and Mali, and the rest of them. So there are a, a number of these contracts in place. And part of the challenge, again, was that these were not even structured as proper power purchase agreements. So beyond the pricing itself, they were more like uh, corporation agreements that Nigeria decides to give electricity to Niger Lake at this amount, or that uh, Ghana decides to give electricity to Burkina Faso on so so amount and all of that. So there, are, there is nothing there to look at those as purely commercial agreements. And we saw that as a big challenge in terms of structuring the regional market moving forward. So what we've done in Herrera was to come up with what we call uh, mad, uh, with a, a model bilateral contracts, saying that moving forward where you have any two uh, utilities involved in cross-border electricity trading, we must have certain critical issues addressed. There's a transmission pricing methodology that ensures that the pricing is also done in a manner that is cost-reflective following the load flow kilometer per megawatt structure and all of that. But for the existing contracts, uh, as lawyers will tell you, you cannot begin to now to take to the parties that the vitiate all that was done in a directive that was issued by the ECOWAS Council of Ministers was to ask the parties to think of the possibility of coming together to renegotiate those contracts based on the model bilateral contracts and based on the transmission pricing methodology that has been put in place. Obviously, it's not compulsory. And we are hoping that with time, these dialogues would open. Of course, if you are CEB or you're Niger, like you will be reluctant to come to the negotiating table. But for me, since these are countries that would also require more electricity moving forward, that in itself could act as a bargaining chip in terms of uh, mainstream, for instance, negotiating with Niger, like in, you know, uh, in terms of trying to now review those contracts. Yes, there are a problem. But uh, ECOWAS has done what it can in terms of dealing with, call it the grandfather contracts. But for all other cross-border contracts moving forward, there is a directive that says that tariffs must be cost-reflective because whatever you do on the national or uh, uh, on the cross-border electricity must also reflect what you have at the national markets. So those concessional rates will no longer work because it's going to have an impact on the regional electricity market. Thank you. Uh, uh, 
from, from the same um, Mr. Ede, there was a question about suggestions on models for a possible reset of the market. Yeah, yeah okay. When we talked about, uh, this is still within the distribution business. Uh, it was, it's, it's within their own, uh, what I would say, their own frame. Because if you go back to the, the way these companies are set up, I take specific uh, interest in the section in the in Epsware. I'm not sure many of them look at it clearly. On, in section 71, 1 or 11, mm. it, it gives a, a kind of uh, open window for distribution companies to trade with top party providers. Something akin to what NEC is providing in the, in the map. Because a lot of the challenge that the distribution companies are facing is capital to invest, to grow their business. And one of the clever, clever ways to do that is to bring in third party providers to join their business, not necessarily selling shares to them, which runs against the BPE shareholding agreement. But you can have, in fact, surprisingly, it is the Ministry of Power that is now trying to capitalize on that in its program. So my question is, why is the distribution companies not looking beyond and taking into consideration? For example, there are areas in Abuja here that have severe supply problem. But if you run your model, they can make a lot of money if they can improve the substation supplying those areas. So it is not exactly like sub-franchising, but that's a lot more different. You don't need a regulation to do that. It's, it's more like a bilateral arrangement, which the regulator will eventually approve because there are two or three different uh, trading con uh, agreements that have to be signed. So long as it is not compromising the contracted power that you already have. So there are openings for that. Again, there is a growing market of the bilateral contracts that are even going ahead without even the regulator coming into play, which is the willing buyer, willing seller arrangement. It's not necessarily the eligible customer. It is, pro it is dedicated suppliers who are willing to go into a bilateral. A lot of the, some of the distribution companies are capitalizing on that. But most important is how well they're able to structure that in what we call their performance improvement plan, which the regulator will approve. So you can start, for example, by dedicating to strong paying customers and then move along the, the line to your load growth pattern. These are models that it, within the distribution companies can create around the regulation without actually falling victim. So I won't go into the detail because these are purely uh, economic and uh, network assessment issues. So if you want details of that, we can discuss that offline. But I'm sure a lot of the distribution companies are beginning to see that. A lot of third party providers are even already Suggested. discussing with the distribution companies. So there are many models outside this holistic, monopolistic model that is driving, making them drive down to bankruptcy. Um, I, I want to know that I think NEC just published uh, a, consulting, uh, a consultation paper, I think, uh, yesterday on uh, franchising. This is slightly different from sub-franchising. Sub okay. Sub-franchising has specific areas you can get into. Mm. Third party provision can be anywhere. Yes, okay. So that's slight variation which they can play and they act, like I quoted from section 71, 11, allows mm. for third party investors to come in at that point. For example, if you want to create new transformer stations, for example, you want to create new industrial and commercial parks. Mm. Okay? You can go. We designed one for Kano and Kiduna under the DFID program. So it was workable. So those are the ways you can deepen your demand without actually going against the regulation. You expand your, your demand, but at the same time, you are allowing 
third party financiers to come in and invest in it without actually diluting your share or shareholding arrangement. So these are things they've not been seeing, but a lot of them are beginning, based on awareness, beginning to see them as a way to improve their trading models. There's a point about, question about um, from the Secretary of NECAN that consumers are important to the market, but what exactly, what role can they play? Um, you see, I, you know, I think that consumers have very key roles to play because um, typically, remember that before NEC issues any regulation, there is a consultation process, basically. I mean, I just talked about the new consultation paper that you have on sub-franchising and perhaps looking at the impact of it. What I don't see is uh, very strong consumer associations or cooperatives that have taken the pains to find ways of building capacity or even getting people that can advise them on some of these rules and regulations that are put in place by NEC. Even in terms of challenges, even for the discos and all of that, I mean, there are times I'm like thinking, oh, you know, don't the consumers know that some of these things can be challenged? And at times it's easier to do that as a cooperative than maybe just having one person. So the consumer plays the role of the watchdog. He has asked who is monitoring NEC. It's not just monitoring in the sense of who does NEC report to. The consumer more than any other group can hold NEC or each and every one of the stakeholders accountable for certain decisions or certain actions, basically. So what can the consumer do in developing this market? An active, a knowledgeable consumer-based group can do wonders in turning the market trajectory around, basically. Because there are some regulations that perhaps may not see the light of day, or even some of them that are already there that NEC is not doing anything about, that you can bring up to the fore and say, why is this not being done? If the license condition says this, why is it not being done, basically? It's all about governance. Governance is accountability. It's holding people responsible. It's about transparency. It's about having a voice to speak. And the consumers have that voice. They should be able to, I mean, we are all consumers, as it were, basically, uh -huh. but we should be able to mobilize in terms of and knowing that our role is critical. If there are constitution papers, it's not just enough to come in there. The consumer groups, even if they, are whatever, you know, they can come together, get an advisor, say, what is the likely implication of this on affordability, like you talked about, on reliability? MITO, for instance, is, is supposed to be an incentive-based tariff structure. I mean, they, you know, I mean we, we keep hearing the discourse, we have so much lobbying in terms of increasing tariffs. We also need to have a very structured lobbying, even on the part of the consumers, saying if this, I mean, that we believe as a consumer group that the current tariff rates are okay, if, that you can't do this if there is no commensurate improvement in services and all of that. So the consumer, because you're asking me what can you play in terms of governance, you, you know, and you can do so much more. But what we require is active participation. Advocacy is so key. The consumer can act as the sector advocate, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, speak out. But that, again, I keep saying, is better done when it's well-structured. One consumer may not be able to have as much impact as a group of consumers. Then one consumer association may not also be, be impactful as a group of consumer associations. So there is a lot that can be done. And indeed, in, in some other places, there are even certain things that cannot be done until you have certain consumer advocate groups saying, this is the way it should be done. So you do have a big role to play in terms of governance. Thank you. Uh, let me take a few more questions from the chat room. Energy issues should be seen as a project with specific tax within a time frame. That's from Chooks. Uh, there is also the question, who engineers the establishment of the coordinator that ensures that all parties in the sector are living up to expectations? And I think you didn't talk about political will, and so you need that coming from the top. But do you want to say anything more on that? Yeah, okay. 
the question is, where is he going to come from? Yeah, who engineers it? Obviously, like I said, he has to come from the top level. And there are two levels we're looking at. At the presidential level, at the vice president's level. But I'm used, I want to use this to comment on some of the issues I've heard about this body. It is not a body. It's not an institution. It doesn't have to have any form of uh, act backing it. But it needs an executive order. And that executive order comes from the president. The president can, through an executive order, create. The PTFP was not an act. It was an executive order. So what you need is an executive order, creating it with a mandate to direct the, res the resuscitation of the market, because the market is dying. If you continue to wait for the institutions as they are today, I'm afraid we're going to enter into the two, three, four trillion debt that will bankrupt the entire market, the way we are going. And no government will continue to tolerate, whereby it's bailing out the power sector every year. It happened in Pakistan until they did a full turnaround. It happened in a few other countries. I don't want to mention it without waste of our time. But it gets to a point where the government has to make a pronouncement. Do we want to go down this lane whereby every year we are going to 1.4 trillion debt and bankrupt the entire market or we should put in place a clear direction to allow the institutions do their work but do it in the right way. It is not taking over their job but ensuring that the entire government economic program is moving in line with the power sector. This is what it is. I hear people each time talking about the act will not allow that. Uh, this will not allow that. When we were bailing out the banks, was it in the act? <laughs> no, let's be honest. When a government is in difficulty, you've got to act. And the only way you can act is through the executive order of the president. So let's try to distinguish between institutions and transformation teams that are put in place. And it's a short term, probably two years, maybe. Yeah. I'll come to the next round of questions from the audience. Um, if there are more questions. Yes, Mr. Zenge. Mr. Zenge, uh, the gentleman there. I, I work with uh, TCA. I was uh, excited when Mrs. Ekerni started with uh, 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 the fact that the sector does not have adequate stakeholders consultation, that there should be a steering committee uh, filled with experts and all that. She even talked about the ty this type of structure in Ghana. But then, somehow we moved away from this trajectory and started talking about uh, the weak agencies in the sector. We started talking about NERC, about, uh, see, to, to my mind, because I, I operate in the sector, I know that we all operate in silos. Uh, in 2016, for instance, NBET signed uh, 14 solar PPAs at 11 cents, 11.5 cents per kilowatt hour. When in, uh, in uh, about uh, a year ago, Senegal got just 5 cents per kilowatt hour from their solar PPAs. We signed uh, an Azura PPA with the uh, attendant PCOAs and partial risk guarantees. When we still had problem, when we were having problem, uh, uh, the grid was not uh, strong enough, or the discos, the distribution networks was not strong enough to take all the loads that the generators were bringing. So there are other PPAs and connections agreements about to be signed by. NBED and TCN. So this, to my mind, is, uh, it shows that there's no coordination at all. And uh, I'm glad that Ms. Uh, uh, Engineer Takulu used to be in the presidential task force sometimes back. So I believe that this is what we should focus on. Uh, if it's working in Ghana, I have no doubt that it will work here. And I, I am not talking of a steering committee 
that would have uh, that would be picked by politicians that will have their friends. I'm talking of uh, uh, a steering committee that will not be for two years, but one that will be by uh, the selection will be based on experience, on 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 uh, qualification, and I mean, so so that I mean the the kind of governing structure that we have now is failing. We have. BP representing government on the board of discos. I don't know whether these BPA representatives know uh, whether the, 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 the discos are meeting their targets in terms of collection or whether they are on the remitting. You, the, the thing is that when you are with a disco, you become part of them. When you are in TCN, you think for TCN. So, so you, you need to hear the, the, the uh, NAC people talk to, they believe the problem is the problem is with the others, not with them. So we need to go back and reset the, the market. We need to reset the market such that when, when we have, when we give uh, this proper and cost-reflective tariff to the discos eventually, they will come up with a business plan. The, this, the steering committee will see this business, this business plan. The business plan would disclose where they are bringing their funds. Because you see, you can't have a cost-reflective tariff and hope to build your, 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 your uh, substations from the tariff you collect. You must, you must build your networks from the equity and debt that you get from out there. And I don't believe in this franchising that we are beginning to talk about, or this third party thing. Because you see, the disco, it will be, this will be another under the table arrangement. The discos will just work with one third party and those that don't know about it will just invest and then it will be a big problem all over again. So I'm talking of getting them to dilute their shares. For them to bring in new capital, I agree that there should be cost reflective tariff. But we should all work, not in silos, but we should all work together. And uh, I mean, today, today, nobody wants to provide spinning reserves. So when we have a grid collapse because there's no spinning reserve, we all feel that TCN is a problem. But the generators don't have adequate, they don't, they will not provide spinning reserve because they don't have adequate, the, the tariff is not right for them. So we need to have someone that will sit above, above NAC, NBED, Ministry of Power, TCN, that would not be, I, I don't think it should be presidential task force, so it, it won't be like APC or PDP. <laughs> it should be a body. Let's look for a very good name. Uh, Mrs. Ekeonu knows how it worked in Ghana. She can uh, tell us more about it. So this is what we need. Otherwise, this sector is going to collapse soon. My name is Sifas Kaleb. And my contribution is to suggest that the community for this discussion, we need to engage... Um, Pebec on this. Um, Pebec is actually within the, the mandate of Pebec is within the coordination that we are talking about. Because what Pebec's mandate is, is about ease of doing business. You can't succeed on easing doing business when your power sector is in crisis. I think what they have just started doing was to identify all the sectors and I think power sector is there. But they just started with the easier process about starting a business, which is very simple because you are just talking about paper registration and all of that. And there may be entry into Nigeria, you give visa, visa on arrival and all of that. But I think beyond what they have achieved, they need to coordinate the power sector if we are going to have a success story of you know, easing doing business. So I think that this is still within the mandate of payback. And as we are talking about coordination, I think it is something that we can explore and it should be part of the community for this discussion. Thank That's you. my suggestion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Imam Dean Talba. Uh, from the discussions... S sorry, if you just let us know if it's a question or... Is, or just a, a comment. A comment, comment okay. Yes, comment. We correctly identified that the problem is capacity, the issue of capacity within the sector, particularly capacity within the policy level. That is one. Two, the failure of the regulator to properly monitor and regulate the 
sector in line with the let down rules as made by the regulator itself. One, we talk about the integrated resource plan. For quite a long time we've been talking about this. Some of us were involved in coming up with the integrated resource plan for South Africa. I participated in this from 2013 to 2015 when it was released in 2015. It is for a period of 15 years, 2015 to 2030. We have been advocating this in Nigeria. Nobody listens to us. And you can achieve nothing if you don't have that. It's not a matter of the government coming up in the morning and telling you that it's going to get 20, 40, 30 megawatts. How? Nobody tells you this. So the issue is this, we need to look at this. Talking about governance, yes. Unless you create the capacity within the policy level for people to understand this. That is one. Where we find that the policy level that the government does not have the capacity, the regulator has to take over. The regulator has to take over to lead because the regulator is supposed to drive the sector. And then the privatization was brought in, I mean the reform. Now it's about uh, getting to how many years now? 50 years? To 2005 to date. It was proper, uh, brought in in order to create market and establish an industry. And this is something that is expected of the regulator to do. Do we have the proper market today? Do we have the industry as we should have today? If not, why? What is the problem? And you find that the sector should have been a contract-driven sector. From the relationship from the dis uh, customer with the disco, disco with the TCN, TCN with the generators, and the embed with the generators. But do we have contracts in the sector today? We don't. The sector is being driven blindly at the wish of whoever is at the top. We have seen it, how Embed was given 701 billion. And now we are going up to the World Bank to give us $1 billion. That is 330 something, something billion. Yes, so this is it. If we do not understand the sector, please, get the proper people. And then talking about the integrated fund. We had a committee, interministerial committee, that composed of all the stakeholders in the power sector. This committee came up with the Re Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy, which was approved in 2005. Why is that policy sitting down there? Since 2015, sorry, 2015. Nobody is doing anything about it. If we had implemented that, Nigeria would have gone, have gone far the renewable energy in, this, in Africa. Unfortunately, that has not been done. Then it's not a matter of creating a body now. You can have an interministerial inter committee to come up with the integrated resource plan within two years. But the issue is the government going to work on it. Do we have the capacity in the policy sector or in the regulatory sector to drive this? If the government cannot come up with this, can the regulator step in that and then lead the team to come up with the integrated resource plan? Unless that is done, we are going nowhere. Thank you. I run a renewable energy company. Uh, I came here from Niger State because I found this very important. Thank you. And, and I see this place as a place where I can get information to communicate to the people. Uh, we host radio shows and we engage in public enlightenment in regards to getting more, uh, uh, more efficiency from the ADC. Niger State has been one of the so states... This is a comment, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Because I'm coming down to customer, uh, customer having the power to, to hold on to the uh, if, uh, distribution company for more efficiency. Now, uh, Niger State is one state where they have uh, generating power dams. But what we say is they enjoy six hours of electricity. They were enjoying six hours of electricity out of 24 hours. And now we have 12 hours out of 24 hours. But now going back, people have come up to stage protest. People have come up to raise complaints, but nothing is being done. You say customer has power, but I don't think it is true in this country. Now, secondly, the state governor made a move to see that things are being done. Set up a committee to go to AADC, come here at Abuja, 
and now they had an agreement to upgrade from six hours out of 24 down to 20, uh, uh, up to 12 hours. But what we say is epileptic 12 hours. It doesn't even come steadily. Now, we talk about political will. Do state government or does the state government have power to influence how things are being done in the host state? Uh, these are questions. But in my own opinion, I don't think customers have power yet in this country. A network for ele electricity consumers of Nigeria, Nekan. Um, I don't know whether it's a comment or a question. Just permit me, I'll just, I'll try to talk like a, an average Nigerian. Only about 30% of us are educated. 70% we are still illiterate. So I'll try to represent everybody. <laughs> uh, Madam, you did say that uh, we have, we speak a lot, jaw jaw, and we do very little. And the last speaker just said it, that really the mind of the consumer in this country is that we do not matter. Just before elections, last year, about a year and a half ago, in one of the uh, NEC organized uh, uh, public uh, information, I cannot remember what it was called, um, it was being uh, discussed that the MITO that is in operation, in operation is going to be changed so, to, so that um, it's going to reflect monthly, that is, the tariff, the amount you paid this month might change next month according to the factors, they said, of the market, that is dollar and so many other things. So you find out that a Nigerian producer will not be able to pro, uh, project his selling price for next more than a month. How are we going to be competitive in, in the global market? We have to be aware of that. Then elections, we heard that, OK, election is coming. There won't be anything. So the public, we kept quiet. Truly, they, 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 they did not change the mito. We were happy. And then election was coming. Then we started having power. Remember, November, December, it was heaven. So it's deliberate. Yes. Suddenly, election finished, and there's no power. Where has the power gone? Yeah, it's deliberate. So what we, the public, are saying is, you tricked us. We went to vote. And now, reality is coming. And there was power on the door of elections. There must be somebody to re rescue us. We, the public, like the last speaker said, we do not count. So if we count, somebody should stand up. We are part of the advocacy groups. We try. But I tell you, if I am to tell you what we are going through, we cannot fight the discos. They have money. We cannot fight the jankos. We, we, we don't even have the technical know-how. Will I leave my job? I'm a hotelier. Will I leave my job and then spend how many hours did I sit here? Can I do that every day? They will employ sons, 25 sons. They know how much they will make in a month, and they will defend the policy. How many Jankos and Disco people are here? I don't know how many. So we are talking to ourselves. <laughs> so, that, that they, is, they may be here, but they don't want to identify themselves, <laughs> just so you don't, you don't sponsor them. So, so most of the time, the public, we have seen so many plans. The thing is that they want to increase the tariff before they roll out the meters. Now we've got about 40% uh, users having meters. You want to make profit in a monopoly at 40%. Then after that, they will roll out the meters massively because they're already making profit. And in, in a monopoly like electricity where you cannot disconnect from Tommy's uh, uh, line and connect to his line, then the government must protect the small industry, the welders, everybody, housewives and all that. So the thing is that if we do not say the fact and use the opportunity that we have here, we cannot, the public, we cannot fight. And unfortunately, NEC, NEC that is supposed to also be regulatory, I understand NEC is also paid by, by a percentage of the income from the, from the discourse. And how do you expect NEC 
to now say, let us have smaller money from the discos. Our neck is broke. So why can't we have the National Assembly actually give neck its own fund just by budget and then hold them responsible for not performing? These things are, are common sense. And I believe, thank you, I believe there are people at the time when they are privatizing, there are people who signed for government. Who are the people that signed this kind of contract? Have you ever seen the, the copy of the contract fully? You won't see it. Because if you see it, you will say, wow. This, well, what happened is, is similar to that. You buy a car from a used car, and you use it for about three, four years, and then you say, ah, this car is not good. You take it back to the seller. I want my money back with interest. That's something like that. So I don't want to speak for too long. <laughs> Gradually coming to the end of this moderator session, and I have just two questions on WhatsApp that I'll post to each of you. Um, the first question is, um, what's your opinion on the push for renewable energy in Nigeria? Could that be the way forward? That's from uh, Mr. Luko. Uh, the other question is, how do we resolve the plights of estimated consumers where this goes insists that estimated bill figures fluctuating on a monthly basis to the extent that the premises with the same appliances will bill, the bill can increase to above 10,000 within a month, even though they do not uh, change their consumption pattern. So if you could take that, you take the first question and we, we, we move on to recommendations. Okay, the question, if I understand, is, uh, is renewable energy the solution? Is it what he's saying or is part of the solution? Is mix? renewable energy the solution? Yes. Yes or no? Uh, renewable energy, you must know, it's, it's, it's been branded all over the world as a, a game changer. But you need to also understand, from country to country, what impact renewable energy can have. The impact it has in India, for example, or the impact it has in Spain, cannot be compared to the impact it may have in Nigeria. When you consider the gulf in the energy level in Nigeria, the renewable energy can only contribute within the scope of the clean energy, but it won't do much at this stage to help in solving, but it can play a role in the off-grid market. So you need to define where your emphasis. On-grid market, renewable is still far away. It may take another 10 to 15 years to reach where it becomes impactful. But in the off-grid market, yes, renewable is playing a lot of role, especially in the solar home systems, even in the mini-grid and hybrids that are being for small cluster areas, 10 kilowatts, 20 kilowatts, 180 kilowatts. But beyond that, it will take a long time before renewable becomes a major so far, I'm not sure we have close to 1% even of renewables as part of the energy mix. It's all talk show. In terms of cost, in terms of uh, organization, in terms of mobilization, it is still a grant-driven technology in Nigeria. So it will take a long time before. So it's, but there has to be, like the last speaker, before he left. Unfortunately, he came from NAC, he was retired. Yes, the renewable energy policy is there. Well, how well is it being practiced? It appears there are disjointed applications of renewable energy that is not actually being driven under the renewable energy policy and strategic framework that has been released. So it goes back again to the uncoordinated approach we do things. Everybody is doing because now everybody is running to renewable. Because they are seeing renewable in the same light as we saw telecom business. Plug in, plug out. They're not seeing it as a national power solution. They're seeing it as a business solution. But the renewable energy policy document and strategic plan has a clear performance for growth, which is not being implemented. So my answer is, for now, it is not the solution. Okay. Then, then the last question for you from Chukumanza is the question about estimated billing and how do you resolve the, the plight of, of, of um, consumers who have not changed their consumption pattern but keep getting different um, bills at the end of the year, or at the end of the month? 
Again, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, I would want to say that the issue is estimated billing, just like most of the consumer issues have been brought forth. Uh, those which on paper NEC had uh, made a lot of provisions for in terms of how to deal with it, in terms of what period of time that you can issue estimated billing and all of that. And as I pointed out in the beginning, there's a big gap between what the regulations have provided for and what is being implemented. I certainly agree with you that uh, there's a lot of consumer discontent in terms of estimated billing. I know that it's been abused by discos in the sense that, uh, I mean, the, the way I look at it, part of the reluctance even in the metering is the fact that you can always pass out a whole lot of uh, bills on a transformer to estimated bills and all of that because what you see, you know, uh, in most cases is that customers who are on estimated bills even tend to pay a lot more than those who have prepaid matrons and all of that. It is a big problem. It is a problem I think that uh, we have to find a way of ensuring that um, NEC does a lot more. I mean, there are the consumer forums, there are all kinds of dispute resolution mechanisms that are in place. But I am also going to admit that I do not see them as being very effective for the time being because the number of uh, solutions or that the, the number of cases that have been solved using all of this are really, really minuscule when you compare them to the amount of protests and the amount of um, complaints that we have when it comes to estimated billing. In truth, yeah, you shouldn't have estimated means, I think, um, for, for more than three months or something moving forward. But of course, uh, there has been all kinds of challenges. I mean, know that someone came to me recently and was saying, oh, he had a new house, he needed to have it connected. Now, uh, in a way to deal with the issue of metering, they're not saying no, no meter, no connection. I mean, but the customer should not be at the brunt of the inability of the disco to produce or to connect with the meter even when he's willing to pay, basically, because again, NEC might think, well, that's a, you know, that uh, that's a way of dealing with the issue of estimated billings and all of that. So I agree with you, and uh, let me also um, uh, say here that I'm not unmindful of the fact that there's a lot of gap in terms of what can be done to better protect consumers, basically. And that is why when we look at governance holistically, all of the challenges we have means that where there is poor sector governance, it impacts on every segment of the market. Every stakeholder is impacted. Because today, there are complaints from the ministry who says, oh, uh, the sector is not going the way it was planned to. We had privatized. We wanted that the whole plan was for Nigerians. However, electricity is not there. You have the regulator who is complaining that people are just doing what they need to do or that the government is interfering too much in their work. You have the discos who keep telling us that their tariff is not cost-reflective. The genkos are saying that they are not being paid. The gas suppliers are not being paid. The customer has no electricity and is made to pay a lot more. So that emphasizes more than anything else the need for proper and good sector governance. In the absence of sector governance, there is no winner. That's the absolute truth. Nobody wins. So it is, you know, it will be complaint galore from the policymakers down to the end user. And that is why more than anything else, this dialogue is so important that we have to find a way of moving beyond where we are. I know, of course, there are all kinds of reservations in terms of, okay, this committee that we're talking about. Let me reemphasize the fact that I believe and I keep saying this, that NEC, more than any other stakeholder, has a role to play in terms of sector governance. But right now, we're in a crisis situation. And where there is a crisis situation, then we need to think of solutions that are outside the box, basically. And that is why we talked about, perhaps in the short term, to look at the way of resetting the market to get things going. NEC, I'm afraid, you know, even if it's okay, that the Act has said you should do that. Nothing is going to change marginally in the next two to three years. Meanwhile, if nothing is done, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, 
uh, well, just it's okay that uh, things are going to happen. But I think that it's important that we do what needs to be done to ensure that in the short term, we put up something, a structure which we had suggested, that can at least have some form of cohesion while looking at the longer term issue of building capacity like one had said about with the policymakers, with NERC, with every other person and all that. NERC ultimately has to ensure that this market or that this sector runs. Works for all of us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that's be your closure remarks and thank you very much. Um, do you have one, anything to say, 30 seconds to the summary and recommendations for action? Um, while, while you were all speaking, I, I, I took a few notes, and something that is unarguable, which everyone agrees with us in the room, is that the sector is faced with a lot of coordination and governance issues. Uh, that, I think, is a summary of the entire conversation. But in terms of how do we move forward, we've, we've had a number of suggestions. One is we need a body that is not necessarily established by law, but that is made up of representatives of different industry players so that they can speak to themselves on the different issues affecting the market and better coordinate the market from a central, uh, central location. That is one point. Uh, the second one is there is need for political will to drive strategic issues that affect the market. That will is critical and that this would mostly be from the presidency and an executive order establishing, as uh, executive order would demonstrate that political will. Uh, someone suggested in the room that we could look the way of payback absent an executive order on this matter in particular, that we could go to Pebec to, to see how, how Pebec can help us drive this process. We also need to ensure transparency in the manner in which commissioners are appointed, including, for example, inviting applications from qualified members of the public and not necessarily drive this on a geopolitical basis um, as we have been doing uh, in, the, in recent years. There is also the suggestion that laws actually exist, that the regulations and the laws that exist are good, but that the challenge is with implementation and that NEC needs to sit up um, to its responsibilities on this point. Then the Ministry of Power needs to clearly understand its rules and limits and not take steps that will be seen as weakening the imprimatur of NEC. Um, you need to ensure that powers, uh, rules do not overlap. Ministry of Power, like they say, stay on your lane and let others stay on their lane. Uh, consumers, lastly, consumers have a critical role to play in the sector and they must turn themselves into strong advocacy groups on policy and market direction issues. Uh, the consumer group notes, though, that um, they do not have the resources and know-how to engage the utilities and to drive this. But it is important, and, and I think that is where every person in this room who provides services um, will need to come in. It is important, perhaps, as a solution for us to have volunte volunteers who give them technical, financial, and legal support. On how to on how to drive how to how to drive issues concerning them, and with that we wrap up the recommendations section. And I thank you very much for being listening audience this evening. And I thank my panelists um, even more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for clapping for our panelists. On behalf of next year, I'd like to thank you for taking out the time to share with us from your wealth of experience, and to appreciate everyone else for coming and for taking the time off your very busy schedules to be with us this evening. The next year dialogue um, happens once every month on the third Wednesday of every month where we pick one topic to discuss uh, based on all the challenges that are facing the sector at the time. So the next dialogue will be on the 15th of May and we will be sending out emails to, um, to tell everyone of the next um, topic that we'll be discussing in the dialogues. Um, please remember that we were, you were given a survey to fill out as you came in. If you haven't dropped it yet, please, please, please drop it on your seats. We'll pick them up from your seats here. Please, thank you. It's a way of, of providing evidence-based intelligence um, in the sector as an advisory firm. So thank you again. Um, we will not keep you any longer. Remember, we have some, some calories as an energy company that you can feed on if you're trying to put on some weight like me um, before you go. So thank you very much for coming, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>